Uh, this week we're picking up um, where we left off last week. We're going to be talking about conceptual and logical modeling, uh, mostly conceptual. And that's alive. There we go. So there's a bunch of learning outcomes, but essentially we're going to be talking about creating ERDs and understanding how the different relationships work and how you draw them. Uh, once I'm done going through the slides, and I've already pruned it down from a what's on Brightspace from you guys, I took some slides out. Um, just some slides that were kind of pointless. I will, at the end, I'll give you guys a demo using a tool called ERD+, which is the website I showed you guys last week. Um, I'll show you guys what all the different entities look like, like what all the different uh, symbols look like and stuff. It's going to be one of those days, isn't it? Fantastic. I love it when my blinker doesn't work. Look back in a day. All right. So data modeling is a method used to document software systems using something called an ERD. Um, it is considered a strong expression of a business requirement. So as you start doing design work for database, you know, there's usually business requirements behind uh, the database work you're going to do because you're not going to do a database unless there's reason for it. Uh, the diagram's purpose is to help document it and provide a very clear uh, expression. So there's three kinds, and I'll be talking about all three kinds today, but we'll be focusing mostly on one. Um, there's conceptual models, logical and physical data models, um, and all three of them are represented by ERDs. They're just different kinds of ERDs. It serves as a guide for database analysts um, to do in the design implementation of software. So a data model is a blueprint for a database design. A data model is more generalized and abstract than a database design. So a data model is basically the conceptual diagram. It is very abstract, as opposed to the database design, which is very precise. It's right down to what it's supposed to be for that specific server. Um, it's easier to change a data model than it is to change the design. Uh, normally you do the conceptual steps first, uh, the reason why the conceptual diagram is easier to work with is there's a lot less detail. Um, if anybody in here has ever done any kind of artwork, uh, you've probably experienced, um, you're like three quarters of the way through whatever it is you're drawing and you realize you made a fundamental mistake. And then it's not easy to fix that fundamental mistake. This applies to all kinds of things, you know, building software, database design, uh, building greenhouses, you know, assembling models, whatever it is you do, um, you know, building Discord chatbots. You could realize you're all the way in and suddenly you made a fundamental mistake and it's too late to change it because you didn't, you know, plan it out properly before you started. The conceptual diagram is meant to help you plan it out. So, there's three design stages. There's the conceptual design stage, which is what we're gonna be talking about mostly today. The logical design stage, which is known as a logical schema. And the physical design, which is the physical schema. Uh, often, some textbook authors actually blur the line between the logical and the physical, because there's almost no difference between a logical and a physical, except at the physical design stage, uh, you've defined the data types, that are specific to the server you're implementing on. So if you're designing for MySQL, you're gonna use the data types appropriate for MySQL. You're designing for Oracle, you'll use Oracle's data types. At the logical design stage, um, some people say you shouldn't even do data types, but you should at that point, you know, resolve all the primary keys, derived attributes, all that kind of fun stuff should now be dealt with. Um, and some other ones say you should use the generic data types at the concept at the logical stage and then do the precision on the physical. Um, it's kind of funny because I had another prof email me this morning saying, hey, Dan, 
So as somebody who's been doing this for 20 something years, and he says, I haven't been in industry for a long time. Do they still do it in like this? Because some of the textbooks are giving contradictory opinions on the matter. I go, yeah, yeah you're right. That's, that's We're still doing it the way you did it whenever you were still in industry. Um, so realistically, there's almost no difference between logical and physical. That's why we're going to basically lump it all together as a single thing. So we're going to be focusing on the conceptual design. So a conceptual diagram includes all the important entities and their relationships. Um, it may or may not list all the attributes. If it's a, what they call a regular conceptual diagram, there's not even any attributes on it. If it's an extended at conceptual, then you have the attributes. However, there's never any primary keys. You may choose to put in identifiers, but identifiers are not primary keys. A logical diagram includes all the entities and the relationships among them. All the attributes for each entity are fully defined. The primary key has been specified. Foreign keys are also specified. And if there's any normalization you need to do, it's happening at this stage. We'll be taking uh, normalization at week five. It's not a good time. The physical diagram specifies all the tables and columns, just like the logical. Foreign keys exist, just like in the logical. Uh, sometimes you actually have to do a bit of denormalization at this stage because you need to do some performance. Uh, you need to create some denormalized tables for reporting, that kind of thing. Um, physical considerations may cause a physical data model to be quite different from the logical. Sometimes, yes, usually. No, usually what you do in the logical will be basically the same as what's in the physical. Just the physical has data types that is tuned to a specific database engine. Um, the comparison I've used for this to explain, you know, trying to tune it to a specific database engine is sort of like, um, anybody here work on cars for shits and giggles? Can you take your parts from your Ford and show them in a Mercedes? Same idea. Basically put, when you design a database or specific engine, you're gonna, although there's gonna be some very similar things, not all the things are gonna be the same. Like, did you know like a lot of Lambos, you know that little reflector on the side is actually from a Ford Escort? You know the little triangle reflector they have right by the rear front fender? That comes from a Ford. Just go figure. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, a lot of cars share a lot of DNA. So that's what I'm saying. Like some things will be the same across the board and some won't. Um, so an ER model and any relationship model is a set of concepts and graphic symbol symbols uh, that can be used to create conceptual diagrams. So there are Two versions, the original ER model by a data scientist called Peter Chen. Uh, he created it in 1976. I was about a year old. So, you know, it's been a while. A bit later, um, some other data scientists, which are remaining unnamed, uh, took the Chen model and said, hey, it's not enough. We need more detail. So they added other things such as how to identify weak entities, uh, adding identifiers, com compound attributes, um, composite attributes, I mean, and uh, other things. Identifying relationships, that kind of stuff. They, they added all these other types to the diagram so that when they're communicating to each other, they can just send a diagram without having to say, hey, by the way, that one entity, make sure you understand that it's this. Whereas the, now there's a symbol for that instead so that the symbols help. It doesn't make the diagram any more complicated. It just adds more flavor to the diagram. So it's known as the extended ER model. That's what we're gonna be using for the rest of this, for this term when we talk about an ER model. Um, ERD is obviously a pictorial representation. Otherwise it's not a diagram. It serves two purposes. Um, 
a the database professionals can use the ERD to describe the overall design concisely and accurately. So if we're using an extended ERD, and let's say I create an extended ERD, then I take it and I hand it off to someone else that also works in the industry. They're able to read it and actually understand the concept of the structure of the database without ever having to say a word to each other. And since it's pictorial and each symbol has a very specific meaning, there's not a lot of um, room for interpretation. As opposed to, I wrote a paragraph and I get a little long winded. Nobody's very, sorry, let's go, let's back that up. Very few people can write in such a way that there's never any room for interpretation in what they write. Because anything that is written down as sentences with words is subjective. But just because, let's say, I wrote something and I think it's accurate doesn't mean somebody else would read it as accurate. It's just that's what my flavor or my how I color what I'm, re I'm writing. Um, an ERD can be easily transformed into a relational schema. So you can take a conceptual ERD and convert it to a logical one easily. I'm putting air quotes around the word easily uh, in the sense that it gives you a really good starting point as opposed to starting with a physical design and you never went through the steps beforehand. It's easier because you already got a starting point. Um, anybody here ever do creative writing? Okay, a couple. What's the first thing you should do when you start writing a new story? As someone who's been published in magazines with creative for, for creative writing, I've done it. I've made like seven dollars while I was in high school. What's the first thing you should do? Not necessarily. Well, you'd brainstorm and then you outline. You outline your story. Like you outline all the major the major plot points. And you're not going doing it chapter by chapter. You're going to say, okay, in this story, the character is going to go to the big castle, kill the big bad foozle, get laid. Not necessarily by the princess. It might be the big bad foozle that did them. Anyways. Just saying, there's always interpretations, right? And then you're going to take those major plot points and flesh them out a little bit more. And then flesh them out a little bit more. But once you've got a pretty good outline, writing the story is actually pretty easy. It's just a case of now getting your words on paper, so to speak. The ERD does the same thing. You take conceptual diagram, you've got the major plot points. Then you can go to the physical, well, at least the logical diagram, because you've got all the major things thought out. Then it's just fine tuning where suddenly you realize that, you know, your character shouldn't be seven foot three inches because he would never clear through doors. So you might want to go tune that back a little bit. So he's only six, five. Um, so, and in ERD, there are three components, entities, attributes, and relationships. Those three words should sound familiar from last week and week to lab. Although we didn't talk about relationships in the lab, we did talk about entities and attributes. The, so we basically have three components that we're gonna, we have to draw. Oh, that's right, it's not working. Now, remember last week we talked about carnality a little bit. So this is the start of a uh, conceptual diagram. And it's showing the minimum types of cardinality. So an employee can have a badge. A badge belongs to one employee. So this is a one-to-one -one relationship. That's the minimum cardinality. Uh, an employee may or may not have a computer. And the computer may or may not be assigned to an employee. So that's an optional relationship on both sides. An employee uh, has a skill, at least one skill. So that's a mandatory one when we look over here, you can see that the employee has a mandatory skill and the skill is optional because not every, all the employees have the same skills. When we are drawing an ERD, we will be drawing the boxes for the entities 
and the relationships between them, and then we're going to fill in the attributes. When we talk about minimum cardinality, um, a minimum cardinality of zero indicates optional. Minimum cardinality of one says it's mandatory, so it's either zero or one. Zero means it's optional, one means it's mandatory. So when you're reading a diagram and you look towards the entity in question, which is interesting the way it works, um, if you see a circle, the entity is optional. If you see a vertical hash mark, then it's mandatory. I'm just going to go back to this diagram really quick. When you read an ERD, and we're actually going to be covering different kinds of things in a bit. When you look at an employee here, and you talk about the relationship from the employee to the skill, the cardinality is on that side. So the employee to skill is on this side. The skill to the employee is on this side. So the, whenever you look at an entity, its relationship with whatever else it is is always at the other end of its line. So if you look at employee, its relationship with, with the computer is at this end. The relationship of the computer to the employee is at that end. So whatever entity you're looking at, the symbol of how it relates to the other thing is always at the other end of the line away from itself. That is actually the, believe it or not, one of the things most students have a hard time with is that, is remembering where the symbols go. Um, I've had cases where I've even had uh, professionals come in and, you know, they're not paying attention to what they're doing and they put the cardinalities in the wrong spot because they're just hurrying, if that makes sense to you. Okay, so this is known as the crow's foot notation. It has unique shapes and symbols. Um, crow's foot diagrams, that's the style of diagram. Basically has entities as boxes, relationships as lines between boxes, and there's symbols at each end of these lines that represent the cardinality. And these are the symbols. There's only four symbols to remember, folks, so it's not that bad. You have the one at the top, which is the two hashes. So this is the line for the relationship and you've got two marks on it. That's a mandatory one and it can never have only one. So it's one and it's, you'd read it as one and only one. A good example of that is your relationship to your student card or your UPASS. How many student cards each of you have? One. Does that student card belong to anybody else? So therefore, technically, you're at the school and there's certain things you want to do, you need to have that student card, right? Therefore, your student card is mandatory, but you're only ever allowed to have one. So therefore, your, your relationship to your student card is one and only one. The second one down is mandatory many, which sounds kind of funny because it makes it sound like you've got to have lots. No, no, it means that you have to have at least one and you could have more than one. So, to use this as an example, again, with you guys, to be an active student, you have to be enrolled in at least one class. You could be a student in the system, but you're not an active student unless you are enrolled in at least one class. But realistically, most of you are enrolled in many. So when you read that rule, it's one or more. That's So that's the mandatory one or more. The next one down is optional one. And it's usually read as zero or one. We're going to go with the example of lockers. How many of you here have lockers? Okay, way better my summer group. I had one student with a locker out of two lectures. Because it was summer, they didn't need a locker. So your relationship to the locker at the school is optional. You could have a locker or not. But how many lockers are you allowed to re register for? One. They won't let you take up more than one locker. Therefore, it's optional. Maximum one. You want a new locker? You have to give up your old locker. And you got to hurry to go get your lock too because they'll, they'll cut it off. That, that may or may not have happened to my daughter. She changed her locker on Friday. She came back on Monday and her locker was gone. Empty. They cut off the lock on the weekend. And put all their stuff in lost and found. Fun times. Um, the last one there is optional many, which stands for uh, zero or more. 
Uh, often people read it as zero, one or more, but it's, whether they say zero, one or more, or just zero or more, it means the same thing. Because, well, technically one is more than zero, so zero or more. And <clears throat> um, trying to come up with an easy real world example for zero or more. Up till now, it's been really easy to cover it with you guys because uh, I can relate it to your school experience. Um, okay, we can go with uh, when you went through high school, you could participate in clubs. Clubs are optional, but you were allowed to actually participate in necessarily more than one club, potentially, depending on what kind of school you came from. So in theory, you could participate in zero or more clubs. The student, you know, would exist. The clubs would exist, but the student may participate in no clubs, one club, many clubs. So that's the optional many. So if we come back to our whole, our whole um, the original version of the year model, which is literally from the 1976, we'd have department employee and we'd only have the one piece of the cardinality showing that a department must have an employee, but an employee may not belong to a department. Sounds kind of weird, but you know, I'm actually an example of that at my day job. I don't actually belong to one department. I belong to like three departments. So I officially don't belong to any departments. It's just weird. Um, the bottom one is the crow's foot version where it suddenly becomes much more clear based on the symbology where a department must have one or more employees. An employee can belong to one and only one department or may not belong to any departments at all. And that's how you'd read that diagram. Then we've got our many-to-many -many relationship of employee to skills. An employee could have many skills. A skill can belong to many employees, but the same skill may not belong to all employees, but all employees must have at least one skill. The crow's foot version shows the exact same thing, employee to skill, but then you can see that the minimum cardinality is the skill is optional to the employee, but the employee is mandatory to the skill, and they both have a many. Because each employee could have at least one skill, and probably hopefully more than one skill. And each skill could belong to one or more employees, but not necessarily all employees have the same skill. All right. So does anybody have any questions about the crow's foot stuff before I move on? I, I try to make it as clear as I can, but, you know, I... All right. So... The, the symbol for the employee's relationship to the skill is at the opposite end from employee. So you got the employee's relationship to skill, it's defined at that end. The skill's relationship to the employee is defined at this end. So, okay. Was that clear? Yeah. It's entirely possible that you've got a skill defined. They all have to have at least one skill. Would you keep any employees that don't have any skills? And I'm just saying, you know, just putting it out there, right? So that's the rule is you're going to hire an employee. They've got to have at least one skill, potentially have more than one. There could be a skill that you have defined in your system that currently nobody has. And in theory, each skill could be assigned to multiple employees. Like if I were to look at my day job, um, if we look at the skill of SQL, it would be assigned to two people. If you look at the skill of uh, C++ with MFC and Visual Studio and all that crap, it would be assigned to like six people. And I wouldn't be one of them. You look at who's got skill with PHP, there'd be three. Four, I guess. You know, it's just different skills going to different people, but we all have a, have a set of skills. All right. Now we're going to talk about strong and weak entities. A strong entity is an entity that represents something that can exist on its own. So a person, 
a car, a building. It exists onto itself. A student is an entity that is a strong entity. It can exist in Axis without any dependencies on anything else. Not necessarily, because an apartment is a noun, but an apartment can't exist without a building. Right? A strong entity is an entity that's able to stand on its own. It doesn't need something else to define it. As opposed to a weak entity, where it's an entity whose existence depends on the presence of another entity. Okay. We've all had that friend who cannot exist unless they are defined by someone else. Whether they're defined by their significant other, by their mother, by their father, by, you know, some important media figure. If they don't have that person in their world, they don't exist. The perfect example is the one that I just used is you have a building. In this building, there are apartments. Can the apartment exist without the building? So you have a place that's for rent. Can it exist outside of its container? You have a house. You rent a room. Can you rent that room if that house doesn't exist? That's, that's a weak entity. That room is a weak entity. The building is a strong entity because it can exist with nothing inside of it. It's just, it's there. So, which leads us to ID dependent entities. So an ID dependent entity is a weak entity. It's the child whose identifier includes the identifier of a parent. When I, so if I were to grab my marker, wherever I put it, And I were to say, um, so that's an address. It's an apartment building. It's a real apartment building. It's across from Westgate, or what used to be Westgate. 1371 Carling. So let's just say that the building is identified by 1371 Carling. And we have a series of apartments in there. So we have an apartment 807. 807 is a weak entity because it cannot exist without the building. If I tell you, without ever giving you an address, I live in apartment 807. It means absolutely nothing. Because you would need to know the rest of the address. Therefore, it's ID dependent on its parent. Suddenly you go 1371 Carling, unit 807, you can actually find the person. Because you have the identifier from the parent as part of the identifier of the child. Because in theory, you could have, you know, 1371 Carling Unit uh, 910 and uh, 204, blah, blah, blah. This parent has lots of children, but the children can't exist without the parent. Um, another example that they're using on the slide is a painting versus prints. I don't know how many of you know anything about quote unquote fine art. There's the painting the original person makes. That's the one that sells for millions, potentially, if they're you know recognized. I can't even say if it's good, if they're recognized artist. And they also do prints where they actually make a copy of the painting, but it's a limited run. And each of the paintings, the prints are numbered. I have a numbered print at home, for example, that I wanted at an auction. It's like, you know, 19 of like 200. And there's always a signature with it, but it's saying that the print cannot exist if the painting didn't exist. 
right? You can buy prints of the Mona Lisa, but those prints cannot exist unless the Mona Lisa existed first. Therefore, the prints are weak entities. They're ID dependent because they wouldn't exist unless the parent existed. The minimum cardinality for an ID dependent entity to the parent is always one. In other words, the parent is mandatory at all times. So if I were to draw this, we'd have A unit must have a building. It can only ever belong to one building. It's not like apartment 807 at 1371 Carlin can actually be in another building somewhere else. It, it only lives there. So it belongs to one and only one building. And the building can have zero or more units. Why am I saying zero or more units? Because they started building the building and they haven't put in the units yet. They just got the skeleton up. Um, there's enough of those going around the city, up going up around the city right now that you know what I mean. Like you just got a skeleton, so the building is there. Technically, once you've got a skeleton of the building, even if it's not clad, it's technically a building. It's not a safe building, but it's a building. So, for a weak entity, so this one here is weak, and normally when it's weak, it's drawn as a double box. Here's uh, one one, and this one is zero many. So solid line. Now this one here is interesting because not all diagramming software follow this rule. So if you're using, for example, MySQL Workbench to draw your diagram, which, by the way, MySQL Workbench doesn't do conceptual diagrams. It does physical diagrams. But if you are doing a ID-dependent relationship, and it's an ident what they call an identifying relationship, MySQL Workbench will draw it as a solid line. If you're doing a non-identifying relationship, in other words, it's a relationship between two different strong entities, then it's a dashed line. Um, ERD plus, for example, doesn't do dashed lines. It does like that. It draws them using different symbols. The, these are a few examples of ID dependent entities. So you got a building with the building name and the apartment number. That's the exact example I just used here. You got a painting with the copy number. You'll still have the name of the painting plus the print number. Um, and then the last example they do is a patient to an exam. The patient name is carried down to the exam along with the exam date. Realistically, it's your health card number, but we'll go with patient name. And it's carried down into the exam because you can't identify an exam by just the date because you could have six people in six different rooms being examined at the same time. Therefore, you can't identify an exam by just the date. You need to know who and when. Therefore, the name of the patient gets carried down. Then we have what they call non-ID dependent weak entities. Um, technically, all ID dependent entities are considered weak. So all the examples I've done so far, are what's called ID dependent, where the parent must be carried down. Uh, there's also things such as non ID dependent weak entities, uh, where the identifier of the parent does not exist in the child. And the way they're using this is they drew this diagram two different ways. And I can't really, can I make this any bigger? Yes, I can. Let's scroll, scroll, scroll. There we go. Okay. So we have two different examples here. We have the same idea where we got the manufacturer model for the, um, there actually should be a little bit above that. Yeah. So you got the auto model on both sides. 
The manufacturer model is the identifier. You got the description, number of passengers, the engine type, rated miles per gallon, and all kinds of other things. And if it's an ID dependent, you'd have to carry down the manufacturer's model and then add the manufacturer's sequence number with all the other details that go with it. Um, and believe it or not, that's literally how cars used to be tracked years ago. They built Ford Model Ts, and literally it's Ford Model T number 80. Why? Because when you bought a Ford Model T, you got a Ford Model T. You didn't have eight different levels of trim. You got the car. Like, for example, I look at my father's old F-150, his 1975 F-150. There was one model for the F-150 in 1975. That's it, 1975 F-150, you know, build number 10,000 kind of thing. What happened around, I think it was in the mid-70s, early 70s, of course, car manufacturers started getting fancy. They started adding trim levels, you know. Has anybody looked at how many trim levels are on some Kias nowadays? You go buy a Kia Sorento, there's nine trim levels you can buy. And each one has different features. And it got to the point where it's too too hard to keep track of all these different kinds of cars. So they came up with something called the VIN, the vehicle identification number. So now the one on the diagram on the right is also a weak entity because you can't have a vehicle unless it's been defined by the manufacturer, right? So we got a Ford F-150. We technically cannot create a Ford F-150s unless the concept of the F-150 has been defined. But now it's identified using a VIN number instead of a combination of the manufacturer model and the sequence number. The vehicle still cannot exist unless the model is created. However, it's able to exist without needing anything from the parent to identify it. Um, realistically, you'd still have a foreign key. It's just the foreign key would not be part of the identifier. That's the big difference. Oh, no. Where was I? No. This one. There we go. Um, the weak entity is an entity whose existence depends on another entity. ID dependent means the primary key of its parent gets carried down. Um, identifying relationships are used to represent ID dependent entities. Uh, some entities are weak, but they're not ID dependent. Um, those are shown as non-identifying relationships, and they have a separate way of identifying. Now, a strong entity, before I proceed, because I bet you there'll be a slide like four slides from now that I'll talk about strong entities. But a strong entity is an entity that's able to stand by itself. Pretty straightforward, right? It doesn't need anything else to help define it. It doesn't mean that it doesn't participate in relationships. It just means that it doesn't need those foreign values to identify it. I've already used the example of how many people here have bought something from Amazon. It's almost the entire group. The three of you who have not bought something from Amazon, have you bought something from Amazon yet? You will. It's too convenient. Um, anyways. Have you ever noticed when you place your order, each item in your order is literally a separate thing, right? They're treated as literally separate orders. Amazon's kind of weird where you create a single order, but then each item is a separate suborder. Can that suborder exist without a shipping method attached to it? Obviously it can, because you gave them your money, but they haven't sent it to you yet. Right? So you know how you have an order sitting in Amazon, and it doesn't show anything about how it's been shipped? And then suddenly it gets picked up by the courier, and then you find out it's being shipped by Intelcom, so you know it's going to show up broken? or lost, or in your bushes, or not at all. I mean, actually, I'm making fun of Intelcom. I've never had a problem with them. <laughs> you know, a lot of people like to shit on Intelcom. Um, but those are, you know, your the shipping method does not get set on that order until it's been shipped. That means that, you know, they printed a shipping label. It doesn't mean it's actually left. They just printed a shipping label for it. But that order can exist without a shipping method. 
Therefore, it's a strong entity, but it still has a relationship with shipping methods. Each shipping method can exist on its own. Obviously, it's in the system. So it can exist without needing any child records. And it happens to be that the orders can also exist without a shipping method. Therefore, in this case, it's an optional relationship between them in both directions. And it's non-identifying because they're both strong entities. Does that make sense? I'm trying to come up with another example, but that's usually my go-to. Um, that's the same when you buy anything online, right? You buy t-shirts from T-Turtle. There's no shipping method attached to the order until it ships. And sometimes you order something from T-Turtle or their associated brand Unstable Games. If you don't know what those are, they're really, they tend to have a lot of fun games. They, I ordered actually something from T-Turtle and Unstable Games at the same day. And they actually use two different shipping methods, even though it's literally coming from the same, literally the same warehouse. But one got delivered by Intelcom, one got delivered by Apple Express, whatever that is. It's interesting because it the way it works is in the it goes from D through DHL in the states until it hits the Canadian border. But by that point, it's already been picked by someone else. So they both ship by DHL from, I don't know where their main, it goes to like Melrose, Illinois. And from Melrose, Illinois, it does clearance. And then it comes to Canada. And same day, one got picked up by Intelcom, the other one got picked up by Apple Express. So there's probably a bidding process, like you said, that does it. But you don't know what the shipping method is until it ships. Your order exists in the system. You've paid for it. It's able to exist without knowing how it's being shipped until it literally gets shipped. It's just cool, you know, just in how that works. And so those are known as strong entities. They're each able to exist without the other, but there's still a relationship between them. Um, this is a summary of the Crowsfoot notation. I think I did a pretty good job on that already. Um, there, here we go, talking about strong entity relationships. So when we have strong entities, we'll have all the usual things. One-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many. -many. Um, it's the same ones as the weak, or the weak relationships, the non-identifying ones. Same rules, one-to-one. -one. We're going to go with the example of the locker as an example of a strong relationship. You exist without a locker. The locker exists without you, but you can be associated to each other because you gave the school whatever it is, $15 for the semester for the locker rental. Therefore, it is a strong one-to-one -one relationship because they can both exist without the other, but it's still one-to-one. -one. Um, one to many, we can go with that one also with you guys. You've got the student and courses. Technically, you can be, a student can exist without the course. The course can exist without a given student. Therefore, they're both strong entities. But you can have a single student take many courses. That's a one-to-many strong relationship. And we can go, we can actually use that exact example as a many-to-many, -many, where a course can have many students or none because it just got created and each student can have one or more courses therefore it's a many to many relationship between strong entities and actually here's the locker example that i just did uh, they're using uh membership but you know how would you draw the one-to-one -one? if you're doing it in a mysql workbench you'd have a dashed line And they're going to be using um, club members and uniforms as their one to many. A club member can exist without a uniform. The uniform obviously can exist without the club member. Usually, just think of baseball teams as a good example, where or cricket teams or whatever you know favorite hit the ball game of your choice. 
the players, all the uniforms exist without the players because there's a lot of these sports. It's not like hockey where a person gets their number and they have that number for the rest of their life. Practically, you know, if they manage to prove that they're worth carrying number, whatever the frigate is, they get to carry it around with them. Um, like in baseball, often your number will change when you change teams. Therefore, the uniform exists without you, and you can exist without the uniform. You can be assigned multiple uniforms, you know, for home games, away games, special games, et cetera, et cetera. That means each person could have one or more uniforms. The person can exist without the uniform. The uniform can exist without people. Therefore, they're both strong entities. It's a one to many. And this last example is actually a really interesting one. Um, it's a car part, and let's go with car parts and uh, companies that sell them. So when I said, does anybody here play with cars or, or tinker with cars as a, you know, thing they like to do, I had like, what, one, maybe two hands. So for the rest of you, you get to be educated a little bit of how this industry works. When you go to buy parts for your car, often you can buy different versions of that part from different manufacturers. Each of those parts could be carried by multiple vendors. For example, Canadian Tire will carry like five kinds of brake pads that would fit your car. They're all from different manufacturers. They're probably from at least two different manufacturers, if not three. So if you're doing the uh, Bosch brakes, the good brakes, you could theoretically buy them from Canadian Tire or you could buy them from your dealership. You could buy from a parts store. It's going to be the exact same brakes sold at multiple companies. And each company can sell multiple versions of the same part. So it's a many-to-many -many relationship. Each of those parts can exist without the company that sells it. And the company that sells it can exist without that particular flavor of the part. Therefore, the company can exist, the part can exist, the company can have many of the same part, and the part can be sold by many different companies. Therefore, it's a strong entity relationship that is many to many. Okay, so that takes care of that part of it. Now I'm going to pull up the diagramming tool and show you guys all the nifty little symbols. Good. It's still recording. So I'm going to go to documents. I'm going to create a new diagram. Create. All right. So I did this with you guys really quick last week. This is an entity. It's an object. Let's call it um, student. That's a regular. Uh, Entity. I'm going to add some attributes to it. Uh, student number. So the student number is a unique identifier. It's a, it's a unique key because no two students can have the same student number. It's an identifier. When you use a diagramming software like ERD+, you can mark it as unique, and that marks it as the identifier. And it puts an underline. So this underlined symbol is one of the things that got added to the extended version of an ERD. Because way back in the day, you didn't even have attributes. You literally just had entities and the relationships between them. Then somewhere along the way, somebody got clever and they said, well, that's not enough. So they added more. So I'm gonna add another attribute and I'm gonna put in, um, cell number. I'm going to mark it as optional. You'll notice it puts an O in parentheses to show that it's optional. I'm going to get another attribute, which is uh, phone. I'm going to leave that one like that. That one's a regular attribute that's required. It's not, it's not optional. And I'm going to add one more, and I'm going to say address. Address is something known as a composite. A lot of people don't think about addresses very much, but an address is known as a composite data type or 
composite attribute because it's made up of many pieces. What makes up an address? Wow, nobody knows how to write an address in this room. Sure, yeah, street name, street address. What comes after that? Sure. I'll call it region, so I don't offend anybody. You laugh. You know, you've got provinces, you've got state, you've got counties, you've got chomes, you've got uh, other ways of dividing, you know, region uh, countries into different pieces. There, region. So this is, is known as a composite attribute. When you're doing an initial design, you don't need to break out all the elements of the composite. You could just put an address and mark it as a composite with parentheses around it. Because that way, somebody looking at it goes, oh yeah, it's an address. We know it's made up of multiple pieces. We can tune that later. Um, one of the cool reasons why I like this piece of software is look when I grab the student, it moves everything with it. Because it knows it all belongs together. Um, I guarantee if you're doing this in draw.io or Visio or whatever else, it's not going to do that. Just the box is going to move and leave everything behind with lines everywhere. Um, this makes it really easy to understand. Now I'm going to create another entity. Um, I'm going to call this one course. I'm going to add an attribute. Course number. Wow, well, that was some good typing, Dan. It's unique. I'm going to add a description, and that's cool. We're going to leave that one like that. And I'm going to create one more entity, and I'm going to call it um, course enrollment, like that. Okay. So a course enrollment is basically a connection between a course and a student, right? So I'm going to connect them. So you click on the connect button, you drag, you click on the first rep, shoot. What the heck was that? Undo. And yeah, uh, that's what happened. Oh, come on, Dan. Undo, connect. There we go. All right. It did the initial relationship. So back in the day when we didn't have crow's foot, that was all we had was that line between them. And then we would have to actually put in what the relationship was in the box, one to many. Now that we have um, a way of using crow's foot, we can actually use nice words like verbs to describe the connection. And we can say, okay, actually, we can go optional many. So in theory, a student is not enrolled in any courses, or they may be enrolled in one or more courses. And the course enrollment for the student is um, optional one. Because, actually, no, that's not true. Why can't a course enrollment be optional for a student? Yeah, you wouldn't create a course enrollment for the student unless they were enrolling. Therefore, it can't exist without the students, so it's mandatory. Which suddenly brings us to the whole thing of, wait, this is IE dependent. It's a weak entity. Therefore, is it identifying? What's cool is this tool also has the symbol for identifying. It's a double diamond. So remember earlier I was talking about how originally we had very few symbols, and suddenly now they've when they created the extended version of the diagram, they created all these extra little symbols so that Somebody who has never seen or had discussed this before can read this diagram and at least get a pretty good understanding of how what the rules of engagement are. So in this case, the course enrollment would be identified by the student, assuming, you know, that's how we wanted to do it. And we are going to connect the course to the enrollment. And again, a course enrollment is mandatory because it's a weak entity, because you can't have a course enrollment without the course. And it's optional many in the other direction because the course may have just been created and there's no enrollments in it yet. Um, 
Then you have to decide, is it going to be identifying? Uh, probably will be because of the combination of the two. Now, so, so far I've created two things, two relationships. They're both um, identifying. So if the relationships are all identifying, what kind of entity is the course enrollment? It's weak. So we actually have a symbol for weak, which is that. So double box, weak entity. So now I'm going to add a couple more items in here. Um, so that you guys can see uh, the other um, items that would come out. So this is flavor one of this diagram. Now I'm going to come, come down here and I'm going to create um, one last one. Okay, so this will be order product and uh, order products. Okay, I'm not even going to add the attributes, I'm just going to do the relationships like this. All right. So this one here is identifying. Uh, the order is uh, mandatory many because you can't have an order without items in it. Otherwise, it's not an order. And each order item belongs to one and only one product. I'm going to leave this relationship also as um, mandatory optional many. Mandatory one. Cool. So realistically, what we have is we have a many to many relationship between order and product when you think about it. Because each order can have many products and each product can be many orders. When we try to resolve that many to many relationship, we have to create something called an associative entity. And that's what order products is it's a, an associative entity. Because it associates two other entities, it's also weak because, well, it can't exist without the parents. Um, actually, I'll be talking in detail next week about associative entities, but that's the symbol for an associative entity. Uh, when you go in, I think it's going to be for lab. Yeah, lab three has a series of quiz questions that you're going to answer on Brightspace. And there's a part with, you know, a diagram to say on this diagram, what's this? And these are the symbols you're going to see. I am going to show you guys one last one, which is, um, talked about this already, shipping methods, and we're going to connect it. And so this is our relationship between shipping methods and order. Earlier, we discussed how a shipping method is a strong entity because it can exist without an order. An order can exist without a shipping method. Therefore, they're both strong entities. Therefore, the relationship is not going to be identifying. It's going to be stay as a normal one, so it's just a regular diamond. And basically, everything ends up being optional in both directions. The minimum cardinal, the maximum cardinality is set because every order can only ever have one shipping method but each shipping method can be used by many orders. And those are all the major symbols. There are actually a few more, but in my career, and I've been doing this for 20, 26 years, 27 years, these are the only symbols I've ever used. I'm not saying that you wouldn't come into a case where you need to use the other symbols. I've never needed them. So they're not as common. Um, the other cool thing is you can use unspecified and yeah, I'll be talking about associative entities next week anyways. So, so these are the symbols you need to understand. This shows the, um, different relationships, the different kinds of uh, bits and pieces. I'm going to try to get these all up on the screen at the same time. I'm going to export this and add it to the announcement for you guys. So you guys have a, uh, an example. 
save, export. Uh, also, and for lab three, you're being directed to use this tool. It's going to ask you to, no, upload a PNG. Please don't just take a screenshot. That's just annoying. It has a built-in tool to give you the PNG. So you click on the menu, you go export image, save. And you end up with an exported diagram. You can even make it transparent if you really want to get fancy. But after you've uh, exported, yes, you're free to color it if you want. I want it in black and white though. So that is the big bits and pieces. Um, the other tool in here you'll need to see is the label. That lets you put in name. It actually has a tool for that. So you can put your label. Often what you'd have in the label is the name of the person who created it, usually the project, maybe a version code of some sort, that kind of thing. That's just common way of doing diagramming. Um, and that's it. So today was actually a pretty short lecture that was pretty dense in information. Take the time to read because I'll put out the page, the recommended page pages for you guys. Take the time to read it. Take the time to digest the material. Um, the hybrid. Hybrid one. The quiz. Um, I just got to double check something really quick, but you guys should be able to see it, I think. And um, so it was released. It's due on Sunday. Okay. Outside of that, guys, you're free to run.